Um, a lot of questions come in or came in on coronary artery calcium or CAC. And so just this is a general question. What is the deal with CAC? Some people say it's a marker. Other people say something else. So take it away. So um, a, coronary calcium, a coronary calcium score is a CT scan that's done dry, meaning without any contrast. So you lay on the CT table and it's a very quick scan. Um, and because there's no contrast, anytime you see something that's really, really bright white in there, which is normally what color contrast would be, you know it's calcium. So um, there's a scoring system where you can actually get some anatomic detail, not to the degree of understanding how much narrowing there is of the arterial lumen, but you can see um, which arteries, so the left main artery, the circumflex artery, the left anterior descending, the right artery, the posterior descending artery, um, and the amount of calcification is then scored and ranked against a percentile. So, you know, this is one of those things that uh, is certainly helpful. Um, and, you know, if there's one branch of statistics that medicine sort of innately teaches you, it's, it's Bayes' theorem, where you update your probability based on new information. Um, my problem uh, is not with the calcium score. It's with sort of a school of thought that says, well, a calcium score, if it's zero, means nothing matters. You know, you're sort of scot-free. And that's you know, unfortunately, that's just categorically untrue, uh, and the data bear that out. So a negative calcium score, meaning a, a calcium score of zero, absolutely means actuarially at the population level a lower risk of a coronary event. And when we say coronary event, we're the term MACE is what we use to describe it, Ma a major adverse co uh, coronary event or cardiac event, so heart attack, stroke, or cardiac death. Um, but it's not zero. Furthermore, and this is where it gets a little complicated, um, nearly 50% of fatal MIs occur in non-calcified areas of coronary arteries. Now, those data are also a bit misleading because many of those patients still had calcifications elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So the way I think of calcification is um, it tells you how many times you've been broken into and what kind of repair you've done. I mean, that's a gross approximation. So a biomarker tells you how bad a neighborhood you live in. So if you do a blood test on somebody and their you know, LP little a is high or their LDLP is high and they have lots of inflammation and all these other things, um, that says you live in a bad neighborhood. It's dangerous. There's, there's a chance there's going to be a break-in. When you see a calcium score that's anything other than zero, well, that tells you you've already had an advanced lesion. And that lesion had to be repaired. Because when you, and I won't go through Starry's uh, seven levels of um, atherosclerosis because it's 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 really complicated and it's hard to do without pictures. Um, we should what we had a whiteboard last time. We <laughs> yeah. just this, we needed the whiteboard nice. this time. Okay, we can throw in the show notes. Yeah, so um, that's right. We can put in the show notes, which is the the sort of different types of lesions of atherosclerosis. Um, but calcification is an incredibly late stage repair. So mm -hmm. when you have calcification in a coronary artery, I mean you've had real damage and it's been repaired. And that becomes a marker of risk that basically suggests you need to be more aggressive in taking care of this, this case. But when it is zero, it doesn't change the fact that you live in a bad neighborhood, and it doesn't change the fact that you can have lots of arterial damage that just hasn't shown up at the stage of calcification. So you can have plenty of soft plaque that's still there without calcification. That's still an enormous marker of risk. And that doesn't get picked up with, uh, with a CAC, No. So what, you know, what, plaque, we, what right? we typically do with patients is, and it depends, every case is different. And so you know, there are some times when I just do a calcium score on a patient, and if it's zero, I don't do anything further. There are other times when even if it is zero, I still reflex into a coronary uh, angiogram, so a CT angiogram, which does pull much more anatomic detail. Um, including the presence of soft plaque, uh, but even there, um, you know, you can you still can't really see you know plaque that is vulnerable. Um, but if a patient has a coronary uh, calcium score that is zero and their CT angiogram looks impeccable, uh, you know, look there, that's that's a much better sign than anything not being in that case. And of course, it begs the question: Well, would you still treat a patient in that situation? That's a hard question, um, but it also depends on your time frame. And 
So the younger a patient is with that finding, the less confident you are that they are one of the lucky people that seems largely immune from coronary artery disease. Where I find these tests most helpful is actually not in young people, but in older people. It's, and I've, and I've, you know, I've got a patient right now that um, I actually just sent to get this scan. Um, she'll probably have in the next two weeks. You know, very, very wonky lipid numbers, uh, very, you know, complicated APOE status, um, but metabolically just fit as a fiddle. I mean, she's just incredibly healthy. But her lipid numbers couldn't suck more. And, you know, I'm sort of trying to decide how aggressive do we want to be in lipid management. She is old enough, which is not to say she's particularly old. I don't even think she's 60 yet. She is old enough that if she has a perfect CT angiogram and her calcium score is zero, which it, by definition is if she has a perfect CT angiogram, I would, you know, that would be enough period of exposure, you know, call it 60 years, that I mm. would say, you know, there's something going on in this woman where, you know, other factors that are equally important to the lipoprotein, the endothelial function, the immune response, are working enough in her favor that, you know, she might not need to be managed very aggressively, despite the fact that she's there. So in other words, she might live in a really bad neighborhood, but she just happens to have a pit bull that's in her front yard that's kind of keeping the bad guys away. Mm. So I was just thinking about, we talk about atherosclerosis and you have coronary artery calcification. And just from like a naive point of view, atherosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. If you have a, if you have a positive CAC and maybe we can go through some of the ranges of, you know, my score is 25 or my score is 2,500. Yeah. It goes that high. I think it does. Go oh yeah. I've seen, higher. I've seen, I've seen higher. Is there a number that if it's non-zero, does that mean that you have some form of technically atherosclerosis or is it not that black and white? It, it's not. Atherosclerosis is, is, can be present even without a single shred uh, of calcium. And, um, and, and to your question about the number, it really is a function of your age as well and gender. So the number is not nearly as important to me as the percentile. It's where do you stack up against your peers? So for example, a calcium score of six, if you are 35 to 40 years old, would put you at the 75th to 90th percentile. That, even though that is a tiny, tiny, tiny burden of calcium, that's a significant problem. A calcium score of six, if you were 80 years old, means you have no calcium. Even a calcium score of six to 10, if you're 60 years old, would be considered quite low. Um, so yeah, it has to be taken in the, in the context of age. Mm. Have you looked into, I know it's, what is it? Arthur Agustin, it's the Agustin score. Yeah. And there's some things that they look at. I think a couple of things that they look at, they look at the volume and the density. Have That's you right. Double clicked on that stuff. And if that, would that further stratify risk? I, 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 I mean, I, I don't use that to further stratify, but where I think it is going to become more and more interesting is there are more and more data emerging that say that not just the burden of calcium, but the density of calcium while on therapy may be more predictive. So I don't know if this literature has been published, but I've seen it in abstract form where on statin therapy, well, so here's what we already know. We already know that in general, when a patient has a calcium score of something that's not zero, you put them on a statin and over time their calcium score expands, even though that sounds like a negative thing, it turns out to be a good thing, provided they've been on a statin. So that seems to be a plaque stabilization. Um, I've seen data, again, I don't think I've seen this in full published form, but certainly in abstract form that says as the density of plaque or the density, I'm sorry, of calcium increases on statin therapy, that also it portends a better outcome or a greater stabilization. Now, very recently, data came out on PCSK9 inhibitors that said the opposite. So um, patients on PCSK9 inhibitors, which by definition in the studies, Fourier and Odyssey were also on statins, actually saw a reduction in plaque uh, volume uh, or, or calcification. And we know that they had positive findings. So, you know, truthfully, that just tells me there's a lot we don't know yet. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's, um, I find it difficult to use and not necessarily helpful to use serial calcium scores prognostically. Um, although, you know, I'll stand corrected by a patient of mine who had a calcium score of, you know, 10 when he was, you know, 20 years ago, 
Uh, so, you know, before he was my patient. But if you look at, if you, he's had a number of calcium scores over the past 20 years, and they've gone from 10 to, you know, 40 to 170 to 650 to 1500 to 4000. So, th and this is actually a very interesting case because this is a patient whose um, lipid levels are not horrible. He's, he's not a guy, because he's obviously been medicated for a large part of this period of time. He does not have an elevated LP little a, but his family history is really significant for cardiovascular disease. His father had his first MI in his 40s. This is a patient, in fact, who I, I said to him, I said, if uh, I would have bet stupid sums of money have I, without seeing your labs that you had an elevated LP little a. Because for all, for all intents and purposes, he looks like someone who would have an elevated LP little a, and he doesn't, which again speaks to just the complexity of the disease. And there are undoubtedly other genetic factors because clearly this is genetic uh, that we haven't yet you know, elucidated, so. And where, do, when you're talking about the percentiles, I think I've seen like MESA, the multi-ethnic study, study of atherosclerosis. atherosclerosis. They have a calculator, I think, as well, that you can you can look at your risk and you can, just like you were talking about, that you could have a score of five and that would denote high risk depending on what you plug in for your age, what your age actually is compared to somebody older. Right, and you can also, you know, use other risk factors. Do you smoke? Do you have high blood pressure? Um, again, atherosclerosis, you know, there are sort of four things that are out of whack when you're getting atherosclerosis. And there are therefore obviously, a, you know, an infinite number of combinations given how multivariate each of those things are. But, you know, sort of if metabolism is out of whack, if lipoproteins are out of whack, if inflammation is out of whack, if the endothelium is not functioning well, all of those things are going to predispose you. Mm. <clears throat> and the statin thing, that's sort of fascinating, too, that you could have more stable plaque, which also, I think, suggests, too, that when we talk about calcium, we might say, oh, calcium is bad. It's not. It's, a, it's probably a bad sign, but the calcification is the, it's sort of the repair. That's action, absolutely action. correct. Repair the calcium, per se, is not the problem. It is, it is that it tells you something bad has happened. And that's, such, that's so important for people to understand. It's, you know, if anything, the calcium is probably doing more benefit than harm. Yeah. It's the fact that you have it that's upsetting, Yeah, upsetting, you know. And so it's actually, it's looking, and it's not a biomarker, it's actually looking at damage, but in a, in a sense, it's telling you that the damage has already been done, which may be a predictor of future risk. Correct. And that's one of my big pet peeves is when people talk about a calcium score like they talk about a biomarker. It is not a biomarker. It is a backwards looking uh, piece of evidence that you have disease and that damage has already occurred to the artery. Mm. Yeah, I think you mentioned that, like you're talking about with break-ins or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Saying the break-ins break already happened. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. Yeah, which might, yeah. Um, okay. I don't know if we want to cover this too, but I, I remember seeing a paper recently. Actually, we went back and forth a little bit on it with, um, was it the Cooper Clinic in, uh, in Col is it Colorado? Or um, they I thought it was in Dallas, but okay. In Dallas, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're right. Um, where they looked at people, what do they talk, uh, heavy extreme exercise, yes. endurance exercise, and they, they looked at CAC. They didn't do a follow-up, but they looked at their baseline CAC, and then they looked at how much exercise they did. And they stratified, and one of the things, I, one of the people that I think either is involved in the study or has done work on this, he called it hearts of stone, I think, or yeah. something to that effect where... Yeah, this was in JAMA a few months ago. Yeah, and they, they showed that... Um, well, they stratified for, I forget what the CAC score was, maybe lower than 100 compared to CAC scores greater than 100. Yeah. And then they stratified into three buckets of below 100 and above 100 and the three buckets for each. So there's six total. The three for each was, let's say, low exercise, but probably more, way more exercise than the average Joe. Yeah. Medium exercise and then extreme exercise, which is really like at the level of probably when you were training for you know, your yeah, Catalina yeah. channel and things like that. Um, and what they found was part of what I think they found too, almost irrespective of CAC, is that in, in terms of exercise, the people who exercise the most, and this is epidemiology, perspective epidemiology, take it with a grain of salt. But the if you compared the general risk of somebody for all cause mortality or cardiovascular death or things like that, they seem to have much lower rates. But what was interesting is some there's a small subset, and it was relatively small when you actually looked at the the N of each of these buckets. It was relatively low, but there was a significant number of people, or I should say a substantial number of people 
high exercisers, but they were also older, which might get to that 40 push-ups thing. We might talk about that. Don't they were, you know, about me. almost 10 years older on average, which, you know, with you talked about the CAC progression, yeah. that they're much more likely to have a higher score, but they had a higher score. When you compared, though, their rates, especially just to the general population, they still had much lower levels of all-cause mortality and um, and cardiovascular death and probably all the, the MACE yep. components as well, which... Yeah, I mean, I think in part this speaks to the ubiquity of mechanisms by which exercise is beneficial, um, but at the same time suggests that, look, there's going to be a subset of either individuals and or circumstances under which exercise can also be damaging to the heart. Now, we know this at the level of, you know, so James O'Keefe has done a lot of work on this at the level of the electrical system. You know, and the way I kind of explain this to patients... Um, is the you know the heart's a muscle whose electrical system exists within the wall so mm -hmm. the more often it is stretched and held for long periods of time in said stretch position the more you are damaging the electrical architecture of it and so that's why we see a significantly high uh, incidence uh, almost 10x that of the general population in highly 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 trained athletes for dysrhythmia atrial fibrillation being mm. a common example. So that type of damage to the heart is, is pretty well understood vis-a-vis um, -vis its relationship to exercise. Um, but the other thing that I think always has to be considered is, look, we don't know what kind of shear forces a person is under. Yeah. In, at the, and again, we go back to what I said earlier, the endothelium is such an important part of this that if you're damaging the endothelium, all other things being equal, uh, you can still... Uh, increase the risk of damage to the heart. So, yeah, it's tough. I, and I would hate for the message from that study to be, well, you're better off not exercising. And I, and I, I mean, right. th that, that's always the risk you run when, when these sort of studies that are you know, complicated to read in the journals wind up in newspapers where the person writing about it only has you know, 800 words to write something and, and also has to include a headline grabbing you know or an attention grabbing headline and and so you know definitely the takeaway is not that you know you shouldn't exercise um uh, but it's that you know there's there's more nuance to this yeah i would say if i was an extreme exerciser and you have that cac under 100 and the cac over 100 all things being equal i'd like to be in the under 100 group but when you looked at the over 100 group and you compared them just about to any other, you would say, I would love to have that type of at least associated risk. Yeah. You know, even with the with the scores like that. Yep. Um, I think you just like saying CAC. I think there's at least a chance that that's part of. I do. You just, you know, you, I do like yeah, saying Yeah, you do CAC. like to say CAC. Yeah. I love CAC, yeah. Yeah. By the way, Nick.